Welcome back to the NASA ARSA training, SAR for Disasters and Hydrological Applications. My name is Erica Podest, and this is part two of the webinar series. Today, we will cover INSAR as related to landslides. You can follow along with the demonstration by using the software SNAP and Sentinel toolboxes. Instructions to access the data used in the demo can be found in the presentation. You can also find the zipped data in the training webpage under part two. As with part one, we will perform the demo and you can go through it at your own pace afterwards. The step-by-step -step instructions are in the presentation and we will post the recording within one day for you to review. So now I'll pass this along to Dr. Eric Fielding from NASA JPL. Uh, thank you, Erica, for introducing me. I'm a uh, uh, geophysicist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I'm working with uh, Al Handwerker, who uh, made a lot of the slides uh, for this presentation. So we're going to be looking at interferometric synthetic aperture radar and how we can use that for observing landslide motion. And uh, today we want to cover some basic background on interferometry uh, and what we call SAR pixel tracking. Uh, those are two different types of uh, analysis of radar images. Describe what we measure when we measure uh, in SAR interferometric phase. Then also uh, do a uh, demonstration of how to do uh, data processing to make an interferogram that shows a landslide. And then we'll, uh, once we have that interferogram, we'll try to explain something about what, how to interpret the uh, data from interferograms to uh, understand land motion. I'm not going to go into full detail on the, the basics of uh, synthetic aperture radar or uh, the SAR data processing uh, and, and SAR interferometry. Uh, you should uh, look at the sessions we did in uh, 2017 uh, to get more details. I'm going to go through uh, a review of that material, but at relatively high speed. So you should really look at those previous webinars to uh, get more details than what I can cover at this time. I also wanted to thank a number of people that have done a lot of work to uh, collect and process the data that we um, are presenting here. Uh, a lot of the data that I'm going to be showing is uh, from the JPL UAV SOAR airborne radar system. And uh, there's a lot of people that have worked to uh, collect that data including the pilots and staff at the Armstrong Flight Research Center and the Johnson Space Center, and a number of people at JPL that uh, have uh, work on planning and data processing. Some of uh, my co-authors at the USGS landslide program in Colorado, people that I've worked with at the University of California, Berkeley, University of Maryland, and of course my sponsors at uh, NASA. So. First, I'm going to do a quick a review of the SAR interferometry and uh, SAR pixel offset theory. You really need to go back to that 2017 training uh, to get more details. The key thing that we measure with SAR interferometry is uh, what we call the phase of the radar signal. And by ta we take two images and subtract them and, and measure the radar phase. This is quite different from the amplitude of the radar that uh, you may have seen in some of the other ARSA tutorials. So the radar phase is uh, actually a measurement of the distance between the, the radar antenna, which could be on a satellite or an airplane, but it's very far away, and between that radar antenna and the ground. And we actually... Um, the radar pixel here shown by this square uh, actually includes the reflections off on a number of different things within that, uh, within that pixel or, or uh, resolution element. And those things each have their own phase. 
so the at the total phase of this pixel is actually a collection of a number of things so we actually when we take the difference if all these things have stayed in the same relative location then we get the the phase difference uh, which is the interferometric measurement so these are the equations if we have two uh, uh, the two images and by these uh, these are the two the phases of the two images and by taking the sub difference between these then we can uh, subtract out all these other constants in this in these equations and therefore get the difference in the distance which is this uh, a row Greek letter row in these uh, in this uh, equations so that's how we do the interferometric measurement to get more details, you'll look and need to look at that other uh, presentation uh, from two years ago. So, what are the applications of SAR interferometry? The the two main applications are uh, measuring topography, uh, which we did in uh, with the shuttle mission called the shuttle radar topography mission in uh, that flew in 2000 and is now um, been reprocessed by NASA and released as uh, the SRTM and uh, NASA DEM uh, data sets. That's a glo uh, near global topography. It goes up to uh, 60 degrees north and south. There's uh, radar interferometry for measuring elevations done from airplanes, mostly with commercial systems and also a NASA airplane uh, called GLSEN. In all these cases, the the two radar images are collected simultaneously by two radar antennas. And that's the most efficient way to measure topography because by, by collecting the two images simultaneously, then there's no changes in the ground surface and there's no change in the radar propagation. That's one of the main applications of SAR interferometry uh, for measuring topography. It doesn't. It gives a moderate resolution. Uh, I think the highest resolution uh, can be on the order of a, uh, five meters, or maybe a little bit smaller than that. It's not going to be as high resolution as uh, lidar, but it gives you. It can get it cover much larger areas. So it's uh, uh, one of the tools that people use for measuring topography. The other uh, main application is deformation mapping and change detection. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, which is being done by what we call repeat pass interferometry, where there's uh, images taken at two different times, uh, where we repeat the same pass of the satellite or the airplane. And we then uh, do this uh, phase subtraction to measure how the ground surface has moved between the time, the two times of the uh, radar images. There's a lot of way, uh, things that, that people use this for, including earthquakes and volcanoes, uh, measuring uh, ground subsidence, and, of course, landslides that we're going to be talking about here. Glaciers, uh, glacier motion is another uh, big topic for SAR interferometry, and uh, we'll be talking a little bit uh, about that later. So uh, the differential interferometry is where we have the uh, the two... Uh, satellite uh, passes or airplane passes, and we get try to get the the uh, radar antenna back to the same location as close as possible. Uh, then we can measure this change in distance between, which is the difference and is proportional to the phase difference between the two uh, uh, radar images. And uh, there's a lot of um, equations here, but the the key uh, thing is that sensitivity to topography is on the order of uh, several meters because of the equation of the fact that there's a, a row here in the denominator of the uh, topographic sensitivity. That means that the sensitivity is on the order of meters for uh, measuring elevation. But for measuring displacements, we actually measure a fraction of the radar wavelength. You'll notice that the displacement sensitivity does not depend on the distance or, or rho. So then we can measure on the order of centimeters or even millimeters, uh, de depending on the radar wavelength. The lambda here is the radar wavelength. So as you can see uh, in this equation, it's simply uh, proportional to the radar wavelength, or one over the radar wavelength. 
So that's a key a key factor. So the shorter the radar wavelength, the more sensitive you are. Phase unwrapping is a, a process that we have to go through because the radar interferometric phase is always measured as a modulo 2 pi, uh, and we have to figure out how, how many factors of 2 pi are have been added to each point in the image. Uh, this is kind of a complicated process uh, in some cases, and and it can be a source of error. And to get to get more not details, I think you'll need to go back to that uh, previous explanation. It's uh, this is an important part of the process for taking the raw interferograms and making in them into an unwrap interferogram. The other thing to, to remember is that there's uh, what we call decorrelation or incoherence in the radar images, and that can, can be caused by changes in the in the ground surface, which is here under random motions over time, or if the the satellite isn't uh, or airplane isn't looking at it in exactly the same direction, or from the posi same position. Uh, those cause uh, additional lack of coherence. There's also some incoherence that's caused by uh, thermal and processor noise, uh, which is generally smaller than these other things. Uh, this decorrelation or, or incoherence of the, the radar phase is basically noise that's added to the, to the radar phase, and it can be, uh, affects the accuracy of the measurements. Uh, this correlation is also, uh, sometimes people use the word correlation, other people use the word coherence, and uh, most most of the time those two things mean the same thing when you're talking about SAR interferometry. Uh, the thing that's important to remember with uh, correlation is that the, the each effect of correlation is multiplied times the other one. So e where correlation goes from zero to one, if you have a uh, a low correlation in any one of these factors, then because they're multiplied together, that will make the total correlation low. That's an important thing is that once, if you have a sudden change, like if the landslide moves enough that it disrupts the surface, then it will have low correlation and you'll, you'll get essentially random phase. You won't be able to measure using interferometry what the motion is. The other thing that's important to remember is that there's uh, enough uh, variation depending on the uh, radar wavelength. Uh, you've probably heard about this in some of the other RSAT tutorials, uh, how different wavelengths uh, react, uh, interact with the vegetation and other uh, materials at the surface. L-band has the, the longest wavelength used from, from space, and that is uh, generally the most stable for so doing SAR interferometry because it, the radar is bouncing off the, the ground and uh, trunks of the trees and large branches that don't move very much. Whereas if you're looking at X-band radar, uh, the, the three centimeter wavelength, which uh, is much shorter wavelength, then the radar is bouncing off the, the leaves and small branches and of uh, trees. That means that those are often moving around or growing even uh, during short time intervals, and that causes the decorrelation and a loss of coherence for doing SAR interferometry. So if you're looking, trying to look at a forested area, it's very important to get the, the longest wavelength data that's possible. That's the, one of the main reasons that we're building this uh, NASA L-band uh, radar system called NISAR that I'll talk about later. Similar effects are uh, happen in soils uh, where in some cases the L-band radar goes into the soil uh, if it's very dry, like uh, the Sahara and ice surfaces, the L-band can, can penetrate some distance into the ice, whereas X-band will, will see the top of the ice uh, or snow. And uh, that, uh, Penetration effect also affects the coherence. As I was just saying, uh, here's an example. On the left, we have two radar images that were collected by a shuttle imaging radar. There were two flights in of uh, the space shuttle with a radar system in 1994. 
and uh, six months apart. It actually collected data with L band, C band, and X band at the exact same time. So everything else about the acquisition is is the same. It's from the same position, same time interval. And the C band on the left here has much lower coherence in the vegetated parts of this is a the big island of Hawaii uh, with uh, Mauna Loa on the left and uh, Kilauea on the right. The bare rock parts of the, the volcanoes are coherent in both C band and L band, but the heavily vegetated parts in the northeast part of the big island are low coherence at C band, but they have a uh, high coherence at L band. That's a demonstration of why we use the uh, we want the L band data for ve uh, ve tropical vegetated areas. The other type of analysis that we can do is what we call pixel offset tracking. This is it's in some ways it's similar to interferometry because uh, we're taking the difference between two images in this uh, repeat pass uh, images taken at different times. But in this case, instead of doing interferometric measurements so based on the radar phase, we're do taking, uh, doing cross-correlation of the amplitude images. And the big advantage of that is that it stays coherent even when there's very large displacements and in uh, many cases when there's, when there's heavy vegetation. Pixel offset tracking can be done with optical images. It's often done with optical images, and it's also done with SAR images. So here we're going to be talking about the application of the pixel offset tracking to SAR images. The other uh, big difference is that we get two dimensions of measurement, both in the radar line of sight direction that uh, is the same as the SAR nephrometry, and in the along track uh, direction. So we get two measurements with pixel offset tracking. With uh, SAR nephrometry, we get only the line of sight to, uh, measurement, except in, 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 in most cases. The thing to remember, though, is that the precision of uh, pixel offset tracking is on the order of a, a tenth of the SAR pixel size, whereas the, which it can be uh, 10 meters or five, or five meters in most cases, whereas the INSAR is a, a tenth of the radar wavelength, which is uh, 3 to 24 centimeters. So it can be a, a factor of 100 less sensitive to uh, small motions. This example is from uh, optical images uh, from a paper uh, written some years ago. The two optical images are precisely co-registered and then uh, we do cross correlation with the uh, small window. We move that to measure how much that that particular patch has moved between the two images, and we move that window around across the image, and then we get a map of showing the the deformation of the the scene in two different directions. In the optical case, those directions are north, south, and east, west. In the SAR case, they're in the line of sight slant range and a long, uh, horizontal uh, along the radar track. The big advantage of uh, the SAR images uh, for this type of analysis is there's no problem with clouds. And, it's, uh, and we can measure the very large motions, which are, are important for some things like uh, landslides that move uh, large distances, earthquakes, and uh, uh, some some glaciers that move are moving very quickly. So now I'm going to show you some examples of how of landslides that we've looked at in California, Oregon, and Colorado uh, using some SAR deferometry and uh, SAR pixel offsets to give you an idea of how these t methods are actually applied to uh, real uh, landslides. The Video here is showing these uh, atmospheric rivers that hit the west coast of the United States uh, or North America. Those cause very uh, high rainfall at certain seasons, and those are um, combined with round uh, lithology is to cause variations in where landslides occur. On the right here is a map of the uh, 
particular geologic unit in California called the Franciscan complex that's relatively soft rock that causes uh, landslides in, in many parts of California. One of the uh, ways we look at landslides in California and in Colorado is this uh, NASA airborne radar system called the Uninhabited Aerial Vehicle Synthetic Aperture Radar or UAV SAR. This is a uh, airborne radar even though it says UAV it's actually flown on a piloted uh, Gulfstream uh, Gulfstream 3 airplane that's uh, operated by NASA they actually now have two of these airplanes one at the Armstrong Flight Research Center and one in, at uh, in Palmdale California and another one at the Johnson Space Center in uh, Houston Texas uh, the two planes are, are very similar. So the air, the radar is uh, contained in this pod, this yellow, white pod that's uh, bolted to the bottom of the plane. And that pod uh, can be moved from one plane to the other uh, to, to operate on whichever plane is available at the time. So it's a very high resolution radar because it's on the airplane. It can be a higher resolution than what we get from the satellites. And it has the uh, big advantage of uh, allowing us to optimize the, the radar geometry and look direction to uh, better image landslides. Both of those things give us uh, better results uh, that for landslides than some of the uh, satellite images. For the SAR uh, processing that we've done, uh, in general, we use the uh, INSAR scientific computing environment, uh, which was written at JPL. This uh, software is now available uh, from GitHub, uh, but it requires some expertise uh, to uh, install and, and operate. Uh, so the demonstration that I'm going to do later is going to be using the, the SNAP software that I believe you've seen in some of the other RSET tutorials. Uh, and the time series analysis, uh, one of the examples is this uh, generic INSAR analysis toolbox, uh, which is also available as open source which is an implementation of a, a type of a time series analysis. We call this a small baseline subset method, uh, which uh, we won't have time to go into details about. So uh, Northern California, we have this area that we've been studying for some time. Uh, we've been getting uh, data uh, since April of 2016 uh, using the uh, UAV SAR system. Uh, these outline boxes here show the uh, four different flight lines, one going to the uh, northwest, one going to the south, uh, southeast, along the valley of the Eel River. Uh, and then there's these two uh, cross lines that go uh, roughly east and roughly west with the look directions here shown by the green arrows. Uh, these results were recently published uh, by Al Handwerger and uh, in the uh, Journal of Geophysical Research with the full uh, information here on the slide. And one of the things that he found was that uh, the landslides that were active, we could map uh, many more landslides with uh, the high resolution UAV SAR images than with uh, previous uh, methods of looking at uh, satellite radar and uh, optical images. Of the uh, 300 landslides that Al uh, mapped, 102 of those were pre completely uh, uh, unmapped previously, uh, which is uh, very interesting. The other thing that, uh, so on the right here, we show two of the uh, radar images uh, from different directions. And you can see it, even though these are uh, converted to the same uh, velocity, in the radar line of sight, uh, the line of sight is very different, approximately uh, perpendicular uh, between these two uh, tracks. The patterns of uh, what you can see moving are uh, almost com completely orthogonal, which makes sense because the, uh, the look directions are actually orthogonal. On the left here, we can see this, the, this very large uh, landslide, the Boulder Creek landslide, moving very quickly down towards the Eel River, uh, whereas on the right, in the look direction that's uh, looking across the landslide, we can see the 
the smaller landslides that are joining the main trunk of the landslide. So this is an important demonstration of how the line of sight direction or look direction uh, is very uh, important on what what you will measure even if you're looking at the same the same time interval. The other thing that uh, Al found was that uh, pixel offset tracking works very well with the UAV SAR data, and uh, there that allowed uh, measurement of uh, the radar uh, motion over longer time intervals over the last uh, three years. Because the pixel offset tracking can be done uh, over the whole over long time intervals, then we can measure the whole total displacement as opposed to just the displacement between a few with the INSAR face. And he found that the radar motion, uh, the landslide motion was highly correlated with the amount of rainfall, which is not surprising. Uh, it's been found in many uh, parts of, of the world, but we're able to demonstrate it very clearly here by using red, the radar images you acquired during the different, uh, during the dry years and the wet years. In the central California, there's a, a number of landslides that have been active along the coast. This is the uh, famous uh, Big Sur coast of uh, California, the very scenic drive with uh, along Highway 1. And that Highway 1 has been, uh, been uh, closed in several places by uh, landslides. Uh, this is a map that's been made from analysis of uh, Sentinel-1, the Copernicus satellites, A and B, Sentinel-1A and 1B. Uh, they found did a, a persistent scatterer analysis, and we'll be to do a very detailed time series for the landslides in this uh, in the whole coast area. And this has been. Uh, this is work done by David Beckard and Piyusha Grom at, uh, at JBL. In addition, we, uh, Al Herberger and I have been, done another, uh, have done analysis of uh, a, a very large landslide that failed in May of 2017. This is called the Mud Creek landslide. It uh, failed catastrophically and wiped out a section of Highway 1. The repairing the highway cost about $50 million. It was a major, major amount of work to, uh, they basically had to rebuild the, the road on top of the landslide because it was just so much uh, material they couldn't remove it. By taking uh, UAV SAR data and combining it, in, with, in this case with uh, Sentinel-1 from uh, two radar uh, tracks, one looking to the east and one looking to the west, we were able to actually extract the full uh, three-dimensional motion of the landslide and estimate the on the left here is the uh, vertical uh, is the horizontal motion of the landslide uh, between 2009 and 2017 uh, converted to cent uh, velocity in centimeters per year uh, in the middle here is the vertical velocity before the catastrophic failure over on the right, we've uh, taken this full three-dimensional deformation and calculated what we call the strain rate. Uh, that's how much the ground surface is deforming. And the red areas here show uh, areas of high strain near the top of the landslide that uh, seems to be the area where the landslide eventually uh, collapsed catastrophically. So this process of... Uh, slip localization and uh, high strain may be a key process to monitor with a uh, landslide uh, monitoring for, for looking for features that might uh, indicate uh, future uh, catastrophic motion. On the left here is another time series where we actually measured the estimated the time series, the velocity from Sentinel-1 data over two and a half years between early 2015 and the May 2017 when it catastrophically failed. And we can see that the landslide, uh, the Mud Creek landslide started moved quickly, moved faster during the rainy season of uh, 2015, slowed down, then it moved fast again in 2016, rainy season, uh, and then it slowed down. And then 2017, it moved faster and faster and then eventually failed. So 
in this case, the the landslide probably, it seems to have had a, a, a seasonal cycle of motion that um, then at some point the, that it reached a, a threshold where it, it, it didn't slow down during the, in the dry season and then it collapsed in May of 2017, which was after the rainy season, but uh, it had already uh, gone, gotten to the point where it wasn't going to stop. Another uh, example of a landslide that happened uh, this year was a landslide in uh, called Huskanaden in uh, southern Oregon. This wiped out a, a section of U.S. Highway 101, which uh, continues up the coast uh, into Oregon. And uh, in this case, we did pixel tracking on this on the SAR uh, data from Sentinel One to measure the landslide motion. And you see here the amount of motion that we're measuring with the pixel offsets is on the order of six meters of motion. And that's what we can see in this uh, photo on the left is that very large motion of the, the landslide where it's completely uh, torn apart the road. In this case, the, the landslide moved by six to eight meters is a lot, but it didn't do a complete catastrophic collapse like the uh, Mud Creek landslide. Uh, so we were able to measure the amount of motion here and not, whereas with Mud Creek, once it does a complete collapse, then it's completely incoherent. We can't measure how much it's moved. Another uh, site that we've looked at uh, extensively over the years is a, a unusual landslide in uh, western Colorado that's been moving uh, rapidly for uh, gradually, but uh, relatively quickly for a gradual landslide for at least uh, over 100 years. The peak velocity here is about two centimeters a day, so it's very fast for a gradually moving landslide. And it's in western Colorado um, near the uh, town of uh, Lake City. Here we've used UV SAR L-band uh, interferograms uh, to measure the forward look directions. Uh, all three, all four of these are from the same time interval, a uh, seven-day interval in April of 2012. And you can see that the, the radar measurement is different on each look direction because uh, it's sensitive to, uh, it's always measuring in the radar line of sight. And the radar line of sight shown by the blue arrows here is in different directions for each one of these lines. Then we can take these uh, four different uh, line of sight measurements and combine it into a full three-dimensional displacement map. So in this case, we're when we have the four measurements, we can actually estimate the horizontal motion and the vertical motion. And in this case, uh, this map is showing the horizontal component with the colors showing the uh, absolute, the total velocity of the uh, point and the lines showing the vector velocity. So one of the strange things about the uh, Slumgullion landslide is it has this uh, narrow neck in the sort of in the middle, and that's where the landslide is constrained to a narrow width, and uh, it moves very fast there, about two centimeters a day. And the other parts of the landslide are a little bit wider, so the flow is slower. And then further down near the bottom of the landslide, there's a sort of mini landslide that's on top of the main landslide that uh, is actually moving in a slightly different direction, as we can see from this uh, zoom uh, image up here in the top left. Uh, the, that little mini landslide is moving slightly towards the edge of the, the main landslide. So this is a, a example of what we can do with uh, the airborne radar where we have the three-dimensional uh, capability when we have uh, four look directions. And we can also use those four look directions to look at the profile of the velocity along track here on the left. The neck region is this, uh, this area where the velocity is much higher at, at about uh, 2,000 meters along the track. 
The other uh, great thing about do, having the three-dimensional uh, deformation surface is we can uh, then use uh, some calculations of uh, mass conservation and assumption, some assumptions on the uh, material properties of the landslide and estimate what the landslide thickness is. We, on the right here, we show the depth of the, the bottom of the landslide uh, and the the black line being the top of the landslide, so we're actually estimating how thick the landslide is along the whole length where it's moving quickly, actively. Uh, in the top part where it's wider, it's actually much deeper. And then uh, right here above the neck, the bottom of the landslide is, is a little bit higher because of uh, some structure in the underlying bedrock. And that's uh, where the landslide starts to move more quickly once it gets over this uh, sort of uh, uh, bump in the in the bed of the landslide, we all we did uh, based by varying how we uh, calculate the uh, estimated uh, thickness, uh, you get slightly different answers depending on this smoothing parameter. So, what kinds of uh, satellites do people use to look at landslides? Uh, there's been a number of satellite systems that have operated in the past. Most of the systems on this saddle, uh, slide are uh, older ones that are uh, no longer operating, but the, uh, the German uh, Terrasar X and Tandem X satellites that were launched in 2007-2010 are still operating, and the Italian uh, Cosmos SkyMed uh, constellation are also uh, still operating, and the Canadian RadarSat 2 is operating. All three of those are public-private partnership uh, satellites with uh, a lot of uh, limitations on the availability of data uh, due to that, uh, to the nature of the private uh, business that's uh, operating the satellites uh, in some of the, especially with RadarSat 2. The Canadian uh, Space Agency uh, earlier this year launched a new RadarSat Constellation mission, and that uh, data is going to be more widely available uh, in a few months when they've com completed the uh, commissioning phase. Uh, just to go through the other uh, things here, uh, on the right is the radar wavelength, six centimeters is C-band, 24 centimeters L-band, and three centimeters is the X-band. The, the first radar satellite uh, that's really been used for significant SAR interferometry was ERS-1, launched in 1992. Uh, RadarSat-1 was a, a earlier radar uh, satellite from the Canadian Space Agency, which uh, was actually in cooperation with NASA. So some data from RadarSat-1 is available from the, the NASA uh, radar archive. The European Space Agency later launched uh, a re replacement for the ERS-1 and ERS-2 called uh, MBSAT that operated from 2003 until 2010. Uh, the Japanese space agency, JAXA, uh, launched a radar satellite called ALOS. It was an L-band satellite that operated from 2006 to 2011. Terrasar X and Tandem X are generally acquired only uh, by request, but they did do some uh, global mapping. Uh, by using the two satellites uh, together, uh, they uh, flew the two satellites uh, a few hundred meters apart to make a, a single pass interferometry for to make topographic measurements. But that data is now also available for uh, looking at repeat pass interferometry. Cosmos SkyMed is a, a constellation of four radar satellites that uh, also mostly acquire data uh, by request. And RadarSat2 as well, generally the data is Required by request. So the new spacecraft that have been uh, uh, launched recently are uh, the European uh, satellite Sentinel-1A and launched in 2014 and 1B launched in 2015. Uh, those two satellites are now both in operation. They're both C-band and they're in the same orbit so you can make uh, cross interferograms between the two. When they're both uh, operating together, the time interval between passes can be as short as six days if they 
if they turn both the satellites on, uh, which is done regularly over Europe because it's paid for by the European uh, Union. They also collect data over the rest of the world, but generally at uh, less frequently. Most of the most places it's 12 days or, or even 24 days, depending on the Japanese uh, JAXA has launched a, a second satellite called ALOS-2 in 2014, and that's still operating. That has a 14-day repeat cycle. Uh, also has some limited uh, capacity for acquisitions, so most places the acquisitions are uh, only a few times a year. There is an Indian radar satellite called RISAT-1 that, that's not been used for interferometry very much. And that leads us to our uh, NASA ISRO SAR mission, which is now planned for launch in uh, January 2022, although there's some possibility that it might be slightly a few months delayed if uh, they don't get everything ready in time. That will also have a repeat cycle of 12 days, but the satellite is being built to have the capacity to image all the land surface all the time, every pass. So we will have uh, ascending and descending the two radar look directions with the satellite going north and, and south over every land, part of the land surface every 12 days. So you'll get two images every 12 days no matter where in the world you want to study. And it's L-band radar being built by here at JPL and also includes uh, a radar wavelength called S-band. It's 12 centimeter wavelength that's being built by the Indian Space Research Organization, the ISRO. 12 centimeter wavelength is, of course, between the six centimeters of uh, C-band and the 12, 24 centimeters of L-band. So it's more coherent than C-band, but sometimes less coherent than L-band. The way that the satellite's being built, the uh, S-band coverage will generally be over India and some limited coverage in the rest of the world. They have some capacity restraints. The L-band satellite, uh, a radar on NISAR will be worldwide coverage. So uh, here's some more details about uh, NISAR. It, the basic science operations is planned to be uh, three years as a minimum mission. Uh, the satellite will have enough fuel to last uh, for at least five years, and all of the data will be available for, free and open from NASA. And there's a bunch of details here that you can uh, view if you want more details. And nisar.jpl.nasa.gov is a website. One of the uh, things I'm going to be doing now is uh, talking about how to uh, do it and doing a demonstration of how we can actually get some SAR data. European uh, Sentinel satellite are operating and they have an open data policy. NASA has been operating a uh, what we call a mirror archive. The main archive is operated by the European uh, Union uh, Copernicus system, uh, but then they send uh, all the data to uh, the Alaska Satellite Facility, which is the NASA uh, radar uh, data archive, and that allows you to get the data from uh, the Alaska Satellite Facility, uh, which can be uh, much faster than getting it from the European archive. The search system for uh, the Alaska Satellite Facility is this search. You can uh, enter a, uh, an area. Uh, in this case, I, on the, this previous slide, we have a, a box here. Uh, this is the area of the Mud Creek landslide that I talked about earlier. And uh, the time interval uh, between uh, April and uh, May of 2016 is uh, a time uh, the year before the landslide failed c catastrophically, but when it was moving quickly dur uh, during the uh, previous year uh, rainy season. If you want to follow along later, uh, these two granules are going to be the ones that we're going to use. Uh, the whole names are written out here. I think those were provided in some of the uh, preview uh, information. 
for this uh, tutorial. So this is how the search tool works. You enter in your area of interest and uh, the start date and end date, and then it finds these uh, scenes that uh, we want. Uh, in this case, uh, we're going to use the ones that are on the uh, descending track. This is where the satellite's going southward. And that uh, ends up being path or, or track number 42 for this area. So once you've done this search and found the, the scenes for this area, you want the, the descending path 42, the, the granule numbers on this previous slide here. The important thing is you need to download the single look complex products. Uh, this is the data product, level one data product that we need to do SAR interferometry. They're quite large. They're about uh, two gigabytes each in, in zip format. Uh, so if you have a slow connection, it might take you a while to download them. Uh, to do on SAR interferometry, you have to have this SLC product. So it's those products that we're going to then put into the, the Sentinel toolbox uh, snap. So now I'm going to show you the demonstration of the Sentinel toolbox. This is the uh, Sentinel toolbox from ESA, uh, the European Space Agency. It's called SNAP. I think you may have used this in some other tutorials. So the first thing uh, you have to do is open the original SLC images. This zip file uh, is uh, 2016 0412. Uh, this is the full image. And it has uh, four, three subswaths. The Sentinel satellite gets a wide 250 kilometer wide swath by using three subswaths that are each about 100 kilometers wide. You can uh, use this uh, data explorer window that I was just showing you. There's a quick look image under uh, the quick looks. That gives you a, a way to see the overall scene uh, with the four, three subswaths. Landslide is in just one of the subswaths. We want uh, subswath uh, IW2. So we're going to look at the intensity image for uh, subswath 2. IW2 is a subswath 2. The zip file is uh, 2 gigabytes, but the, when you unzip it, uh, which uh, SNAP has to do, it actually becomes around um, 4 gigabytes. So each one of these images is over a gigabyte, and it takes some time to work with, especially if you have a slow computer and, and not very much memory. One of the things you'll, you'll notice first is that there's these um, these stripes as part of the data acquisition. In order to cover the three subswaths, the uh, Sentinel-1 satellites switch back and forth between the subswaths. They send out a burst of pulses covering uh, one subswath, and then they'll send out switch to a different subswath, send out a burst of pulses. And those bursts are shown are separated by little black lines here, uh, which are showing you where the burst boundaries are. Later, we'll uh, work on how to how to get rid of that. And you'll notice that uh, the SAR image is uh, flipped east-west, even though the the coast is trending uh, mostly northwest-southeast. It's it looks like it's trending the opposite opposite direction here because all the radar image is uh, always shown uh, with the left side here being the side closest to the satellite, the satellites uh, east of here and looking to the west. So the, uh, the left side here is the east side of the, of the radar image uh, closest to the satellite. So in order to do the INSAR processing, we have to do uh, the first step, which is co-registering the two SR, uh, SLC images. Uh, I'll go back here. I have to open the second image. This is the, the date uh, 2016-05-06. The next step is to do the co-registration. Radar. Co-registration, Sentinel-1 tops co-registration. 
TOPS is the name for the Scansar, special Scansar mode that they use here in uh, Sentinel-1. So it's, we have to set up uh, the two images. There's uh, image one is set to the uh, April scene. Image two, we need to set it this to the May scene. Uh, we want subswath two yeah, for both images. I have to select subswath two. And uh, the rest of this we don't need to uh, change. And so then we uh, once you get the the right scene set up and the uh, subswath uh, IW2, you'll uh, run this. I'm not going to run it because it takes uh, several minutes to run. I'm going to go and uh, open the file that I already ran previously. Uh, and that gives us this uh, orb stack output. I have to open the dim file. So uh, after uh, co-registration, we have the master scene is the April 12th scene. And the what they call the slave or, or uh, reference scene is uh, the May 6th scene. Now, if we uh, look at these two images, they're going to be precisely co-registered. It uses uh, the DEM to uh, enable the precise co-registration, uh, even uh, considering the baseline. That's the result of the first step. The next step is forming the raw interferogram. Select that orb stack output and uh, make the interferogram. Interferogram formation. So the input is the orb, orb stack program. And I'm just going to call this uh, IFG2. We don't need to change any of these. I'm going to open the one that I ran previously. It takes a while to run. Orb stack IFG dim. So this is the raw interferogram. If we look at the bands of this, now we can see that there's uh, an intensity band that looks very similar to the original uh, intensity image. But it's now the uh, intensity of the uh, interferogram, which is uh, slightly, it's sort of like a, a average of the two uh, radar images, but it's not exactly the same. Again, it t it's a pretty big file, so it takes some time to make an image out of it. Uh, there it goes. So this is the, uh, now this is the intensity of the uh, combined image, the interferogram. We can also look at the phase. It's calculated the phase as well. And the first thing you'll notice is that the phase is all is very noisy. In part, that's because we haven't yet subtracted out the phase that's due to topography. And in part, it is that a lot of this is ocean. And this is all, of course, uh, this is a raw interferogram, so it's a uh, it's still modulo two pi. We can zoom in here. Here's the burst boundary. Uh, this, you can see a, a very faint line here. That's uh, that's the coastline. So to below that is just ocean, which is completely incoherent because it changes drastically between the two images. And further to the up, there's uh, some more coherent phase, but it's still it looks kind of strange because it's uh, the pixel sizes are are different in range and. In the along track and cross track directions, and we'll um, need to do some more work to make a useful interferogram out of this. So that's the uh, basic interferogram. The next step is to uh, do what we call debursting. That's uh, to actually merge the bursts of the interferogram together to make one uh, complete image. 
and that will get rid of these weird discontinuities between the bursts. So the next step is uh, to run the deburst program. Again, I'm going to uh, just go and get the deburstted image to save some time. That's number five. The bursting also uh, makes it uh, somewhat smaller. Uh, now it's going. Okay, here we go. Here's the result of the, uh, it, this is the interferogram after the deburstening. Again, we still have uh, most of the scene, a large part of the scene is pure noise because it's ocean. But now you can start to see that there's some fringes here in the, in the, in the top where it's land. So the next step after deburstening, you can look at the radar image, is to, is to uh, subtract the topographic phase. This is the phase that's uh, due to the elevation and the different uh, and the baseline of the interferometric pair. Go under interferometric uh, sentinel one tops. Wait a minute. Uh, Interferometric products topographic phase removal. Interferometric products topographic phase removal. Again, you're, you choose the previous uh, deburstered interferogram. Processing parameters don't need to change anything. Open the, it's called uh, DINSAR, that's differential INSAR, meaning that we've subtracted out the topography. And that's now uh, image number six. And uh, just for the sake of time, I'm going to skip displaying that one and go to the next step. Uh, the default uh, processing in SNAP is to use the three arc second. That's 90 meter uh, resolution DEM. Uh, but you might need to use a one, the one arc second or 30 meter SRTM data to get a, a higher resolution. Uh, because landslides are quite small, uh, you might get better results. It takes some more time to run, but uh, it's worth uh, getting the higher resolution uh, for landslides. That's uh, here. Under processing parameters, you can get SRTM one arc second height files auto download. So you do need to change that one parameter. So uh, the next step is to do some filtering and uh, multi-looking. Multi-looking is what uh, radar processing people use is uh, to uh, average several pixels together. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why radar people call that multi-looking, but that's why they always call it. So that's what I use. And so the first step is to uh, do the uh, filtering. Uh, in this case, we're going to do the filtering first and then do the multi-looking. You can also do the opposite order. Radar interferometric filtering. You have to use interferometric filtering. You can't just use uh, the standard speckle filtering. Only the interferometric filtering is going to know how to filter the radar phase. Uh, I use uh, this uh, Goldstein filter uh, named after Dick Goldstein, who was a, a pioneer of radar interferometry here at JPL. And he developed this kind of a filter that uh, works really well in most cases. Usually the default parameters work well, but for, for, interfer for uh, landslide processing, we usually need to change this uh, adaptive filter exponent to uh, I use 0 0.4 to uh, reduce the amount of filtering because otherwise uh, you can smear out the, the landslide uh, too much. So uh, again, I'm going to just skip running this because it takes some time to run. I'm going to go and open the filtered interferogram, number seven. Let me show you the image from this.
Okay, so now this is the uh, interferogram uh, after the phase filtering, uh, but before the multi-looking. And you can see now that uh, there's a big uh, difference between the uh, land to the north and the ocean to the south. There's, uh, there's no uh, coherent phase in the ocean, which is what we expect because the, uh, the ocean surface changes completely. And on the land, we can see that there's phase over many areas, but not everywhere. And that's um, largely related to the uh, presence of tall trees in some places. As, as we discussed earlier, this is C-band data, so it's going to have some low coherence where there's uh, tall trees. So that's the filtering. Go back to the slides here. Uh, the next step is multi-looking. Multi-looking, is, as I mentioned, is the averaging of multiple pixels in each direction. For this Sentinel-1 data, it's, we actually, it actually will do uh, more averaging in the cross-track or range direction because the pixels are about two meters in the, the cross-track direction at the single look complex uh, spacing, and but 14 meters in the along track direction. That makes it very uh, far from square pixels. So the thing to remember for landslides is that you need to maintain as much resolution as you can, given the satellite data that you have. With Sentinel-1, we don't have too much choice. So in this case, the, the, the Mud Creek landslide is about 500 meters long and 500 meters wide. So we want to get the highest possible resolution as we mentioned, the other key thing that for multi-looking is you can't do the multi-looking on the um, the phase. You have to do it on the original uh, complex information, the I and the Q bands. That's the uh, complex real and imaginary parts. If you take the multi-looks on the phase, it, you'll get the not useful results. Uh, this is a mistake that I made once or twice myself, uh, but that's why I'm emphasizing it here. Uh, so if we go back to snap and do the multi-looking radar SAR utilities. Make sure it's selected the uh, filtered interferogram. We want to get square pixels. And by default here, it's set to, to uh, take uh, four looks in range and one look in azimuth. And that'll give you a, a ground range GR uh, pixel size of around 14 meters. That's the highest possible resolution for, for Sentinel-1. And again, we need to select the I and the Q. Uh, command. And not the intensity or phase uh, bands. In this case, I've already uh, done that processing step. I'm just going to open the result. Number eight. And we can see after multi looking, um, we add the I, Q, and coherence uh, bands. I told it to recalculate the, co the phase uh, earlier, so it's already pre calculated here. Uh, as I mentioned in the slides, after the multi-looking, you have to do uh, the uh, data conversion and uh, convert that I and Q to phase. So now we can look at the phase band that was uh, calculated from the I and Q. This one will take a little bit uh, less time to load because we've uh, averaged, uh, it has four times fewer pixels. and First thing you'll notice is that uh, it, it's much narrower. Uh, that's because we've averaged four pixels in the 
range or, or cross track direction, we didn't average any pixels in the along track direction. So top direction of the interferogram is is the same, but the width has changed and it's four times narrower. But this is uh, now approximately uh, the aspect ratio of the of the ground uh, pixels from from the Sentinel. Now it starts to become a little bit more clear that there is uh, some areas here that have different phase from others. So the first thing that we'd like to do is uh, uh, take a subset. Uh, because the landslide is only a small part of the scene, the phase unwrapping step uh, is time consuming if you try to do it on a, full, a large scene, especially this scene that has a lot of ocean in it. The landslide is actually here in the, uh, along the coast. It's this little patch here. next to the coast where we see these uh, uh, def different phases. For taking a subset, we use this uh, command raster subset, and we can enter in these geographic coordinates, raster subset geographic coordinates. Thirty-five point eight nine, thirty-five point eight two. Actually, the subset's going to be even smaller than this area that I had zoomed into. So uh, it's one twenty-one point four six. and minus 121.39. We want all the bands. Let me uh, just find the subset that I did before. Okay, here's the subset that I did before uh, with this data set. Ah, I see what it is. It's not showing me the bands. So the subset is much easier to display. It's much smaller and uh, it's also a smaller area. So this is the area that we're going to actually going to use for the rest of the processing, including the phase unwrapping. So the phase unwrapping is, a, as I mentioned earlier, is a important but time consuming process if you do a big area. With uh, SNAP uh, 7.0, there's a new a plugin for SNAFU. So SNAFU is the phase unwrapping algorithm that uh, recommended by SNAP. Uh, it used to be that you had to run it uh, externally from the command line, but now uh, with uh, this plugin for Windows and on Linux, you can do uh, install as a plugin and it will automatically uh, download the executable for you. And uh, then you can run it from the uh, command from the within snap without having to do the command line, which is what we had to do uh, previously. Uh, if you look at the 2017 tutorial and, and the 2018 tutorial, we didn't have that option, but now it's available in SNAP, so it's, a, it's quite a big, big improvement. On the Mac, you still have to do a external installation and add, add it to your uh, command path in SNAP. 
I'm not going to go through the that procedure because probably not a lot of the people on this are uh, doing that. Uh, so now under unwrapping, we have uh, snafu unwrapping. As a command, you give the subset as your product. Uh, the processing parameters. The main the, for this, you have to actually specify a separate folder. In this case, uh, I have to do a separate folder. But I'm not going to run that now. I'm going to load the one that's already been unwrapped. And that's down here. Is the multi look unwrapped? So. So even even uh, with the the plugin, you still have to do two steps to do the phase unwrapping. First, you do this Snafu export, which it exports the Snafu image to a separate to an external file format that the Snafu can read, and then you can run the Snafu unwrapping from the command line or through the the, the plugin. So the first uh, step is to uh, to run the phase unwrapping. You have to do this uh, export step. Radar interferometric unwrapping snafu export. So you want to select the subset. You need to tell it a target folder. This can be this needs to be put in a separate folder. For uh, this purpose, I'm just going to create a new folder called test, unwrap, create. Okay, uh, I want uh, a smooth statistical cost mode uh, number of rows. The default number of row overlap is zero. You need that to be at least. 100 pixels, but in this case, I've, since I've already done a subset, I'm going to just change the uh, number of tile rows to one and the number of tile columns to one. These are all the uh, settings for the uh, Snafu export. Now, if we, I go to that directory, I'll find that it's exported the files. The next step is to actually run the phase unwrapping. That's the Snafu unwrapping. With the plugin, uh, that uh, doesn't work on on the Mac, so I'm not going to demonstrate that here. But then at the end of the unwrapping, you have to do the Snafu import. So you have to tell it the subset that you use to that you export it because it needs to get the um, metadata from there. You need to tell it the uh, unwrapped phase file and the uh, target. You can have it uh, save the wrapped interferogram in addition to the unwrapped interferogram. Uh, and then you tell it the target that you want to write it to and the directory and run it. And then at the end, you'll end up with a subset uh, that's unwrapped like this. This is the one that I unwrapped previously. And I have uh, the, I checked when I ran this earlier, I had checked the uh, option to save the wrapped phase and the unwrapped phase. So I have two phase layers here. The unwrapped phase is the new one. In this case, the, this was a, an early unwrapping, which didn't work very well. It's the one that worked better. Unwrapping version two. going to do the import on this uh, version 2.
Okay, uh, so this is uh, the subset after I've taken the subset. And this is uh, after I redid the processing with a, a lower amount of filtering, which works better for the phase unwrapping. So this is subset two. Uh, when, then when I un did the uh, phase unwrapping, I'm going to import the results with subset two, read the unwrapped phase, Unwrapping version two. Uh, let's see. Change uh, this to smooth. Ah, uh, here's where we, we have to select it here. I need to select the HDR file that's the unwrapped phase. And we're going to write this out to So we will need to add the uh, um, UNW to the name of the, to the output file name to make sure it's a different file. Uh, that already exists. I'm just going to read it in. Okay, so now we have the unwrapped phase number 13. This is the uh, unwrapped phase of this, my, the second attempt that I did uh, after reducing the amount of filtering. And uh, now I can see it did a better job on the phase unwrapping. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's uh, important to make sure that the filtering is low when you're trying to unwrap a, something like a landslide that has very uh, small area, because otherwise the uh, and large deformation. This is the unwrapped phase. The next step is to convert the unwrapped phase to displacement. We can also uh, change the color map. This is the, the full range of unwrapped phase. If we change it to 
of the histogram, we get a much better view. The, the unwrapped phase in the water is just going to be not useful. It's it doesn't mean anything. It's because you're unwrapping. It's unwrapped in noise there. And then the next step is to uh, convert the unwrapped phase to displacement. We use the unwrapped phase to displacement under interferometric products phase to displacement. Again, we make sure it's reading the, the last uh, step. And it's going to write it out to UNW underscore DSP. Already set up with the directory. Uh, I've already done that, so I'm just going to load it in. And that's here. Now you can see in the uh, DSP file, it only has one band. And uh, again, if you look at the 100% histogram scaling, it, it, the landslide is uh, relatively uh, a little bit hard to see. If we change to 95%, it'll show more clearly. In this case, remember the whole this whole thing is still in radar coordinates. So the left side here is the east. The eastern lobe of the landslide is moving faster than the western lobe back in April, May of uh, 2016. Uh, so then the um, final step. Uh, the other thing to notice here is uh, written in the slide. The displacements are now in meters because it's changed it to meters and the sign was changed. So positive displacement is towards the satellite. So we can see that um, uh, the units here are in meters. The minimum uh, is minus 0 0.145 meters. The maximum is 0 0.05. This uh, left part of the landslide uh, has negative displacement. That means it uh, moved either away from the radar it moved away from the the satellite the satellite is over here on the on the left side and it moved so it moved away from the satellite and it means it moved either to the west and or down and in this case it probably moved both uh, the landslide is moving down and to the west so displacements are negative as seen on this uh, displacement map So the next step is to uh, geocode the results. In SNAP, they call uh, geocoding terrain correction. I'm going to open the, uh, the result uh, and also show you where it is. It's here under products, geometric terrain correction, range Doppler terrain correction. So we want to do that on the displacement product subset, processing parameters. Uh, for landslides, you definitely want to use the higher resolution, one arc second SRTM data. In this case, it's automatically chosen the output spacing to be 15 meters. We want to mask out areas without elevation, and we want to do the displacement band. And it's going to put it in the terrain correction DSP TC file that already exists because I ran it before. I just load it in subset of. I'm going to load it in. Here's the subset of subset to DSP terrain correction dot DEM. number 16 displacement uh, they've added now uh, the VV because it's displacement in the VV uh, polarization 
this, so this is the uh, terrain displacement map. Uh, of course, it's also uh, geocoded all the ocean. Uh, so it's really a, a little bit distracting to see the ocean here. Uh, so the, the last step we want to run is, um, this is the display. is a masking uh, under snap uh, raster masks land C mask we can do a land C mask on this subset and under per, we want to keep we want to ma in this case we want to mask out the C we don't want to see the land we want to keep the land and mask out the sea. So I run this. I've already done this before, so I'm just going to load the result. I have to make sure you get the dim file when you're loading a file that already exists. The band name is still displacement VV. In SNAP, the only available masking is using the SRTM 3 arc second, 90 meter resolution. So the coastline is a little bit coarse compared to the size of the 15 meter pixel size of the, of the interferogram that we processed. So this is our uh, final interferogram result and we can see now that it's uh, with east to the right, that the east uh, eastern part, there's these two lobes of deformation uh, that uh, we've seen consistently in both the uh, Sentinel-1 and the UAV SAR data. The eastern lobe uh, was moving faster than the western lobe in, during this time interval. That wasn't true in every time interval, uh, but it was true during this time interval. As before, after we convert it to the displacement, the negative displacements mean that the ground surface is moving away from the radar. That in this, now that it's geocoded, the satellite is over here to the right in the east. So negative means it moved to the west and, or down. And that is consistent with the slope of this surf, surface here being west and, and south. The, INSAR is only sensitive to the line of sight motion, so the, the southward motion is not uh, being recorded by the, the interferogram, but the, the westward component and the downward component as it's moving down the hill are included in the uh, line of sight deformation. So we can see that the uh, landslide is moving down the slope as, as we would expect. So that's our final result of the demonstration. And we can do some additional analysis, uh, such as doing a profile. First, we draw a line across the uh, uh, landslide using the vector tool. Now we can do the uh, plot of the profile. OK. There it goes. Here's our plot. Again, uh, negative uh, displacement means it moved away from the radar. On the sides here, it's roughly minus 4 centimeters, uh, 0.04 meters. In the middle of the landslide, it's moved uh, about uh, 0.7, 0.75 meters. We subtract that from the from the uh, land to the east, then it's a difference of about three or three and a half centimeters of motion uh, during the 12 day interval of this interferogram. Actually, this is a 24 day interval. And the ground surface has moved about three centimeters. It's negative because it's moving away from the satellite. Uh, if you have a different look direction, then it might be moving towards the satellite. 
So you have to be very uh, careful about the look direction to, to interpret the, the results. You can also export this uh, result to a file under export SAR formats. Uh, you can do as a GeoTIFF. Then I can uh, use uh, a GIS such as uh, QGIS or ArcGIS. Open a new project. Open a new file. Fun file. Here's the TIFF file. And here we are with that same data set in uh, a GIS. The default is uh, black and grayscale. Change to uh, pseudo color. Uh, now this is pseudo colored with uh, red meaning uh, negative, blue meaning positive. There's also, uh, obviously, you can see there's other places in this scene where there's uh, negatives and positives. Most of those are areas of very low coherence. Uh, if we go back to SNAP, uh, one of the other things is the coherence or, or correlation estimate. Because landslides often happen in areas where there are um, steep slopes and, and trees that, that cause low coherence, it's very important to uh, look at the coherence map and compare it to your measurements uh, to be sure whether what you're seeing is actual ground deformation or just noise that's been uh, unwrapped. The other uh, thing to look at is the, the original unwrapped phase before uh, we did the geocoding also has this kind of, a, um, this is the unwrapped phase if we look at the wrapped phase, you can see in the wrapped phase that those areas just look like noise. In fact, uh, the, 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 that area of noise doesn't look much different than the ocean down here to, below. Uh, so that's another indication that these measurements here are not valid measurements, and you really can't use those uh, phase measurements or displacement measurements in interpretation. If it doesn't look like a, a stable phase, then it's not going to be a valid measurement. So this is uh, the end of the webinar. And now we're going to uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fielding, for that demo. I'm sure that there are many questions. So we'll go straight into the Q&A session. As always, please just type your questions into the question box and we will address as many questions as possible. Hello, this is Eric Fielding and I'll uh, we'll be answering as many of the questions as we can in the uh, time available. The uh, first question here are, what, are what are the chances of not getting a perfect interferogram? I have low vegetation. I took a larger uh, B perp, which is the perpendicular baseline, and I was hoping to get good uh, temporal res uh, resolution with uh, Sentinel-1. But I'm still seeing uh, less coherence in my area. Uh, the important thing is that uh, there are other surface changes that can cause low coherence in interferograms. Uh, besides vegetation that you have to consider. Uh, for example, heavy rain, snow cover, uh, motion of loose sand, flooding, uh, or erosion and deposition of uh, material uh, can cause the radar reflection to change and therefore uh, low coherence. Question number two. Uh, what is the difference between SRTM and NASA DEM? Uh, the the new de NASA DEM uh, that's uh, still uh, in the final release uh, 
is a, a reprocessing of the original SRTM data that was acquired in 2000, uh, where they reprocessed it to improve the data quality. It's uh, the same data, but uh, improved. Question number three. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what um, this question is about, but uh, the question is uh, says, uh, the displacement in a line of sight image, LOS image, it depends on correction. How can we correct this? Uh, well, there are several corrections that can be done to measure line of sight displacements within SAR. The mandatory correction that you have to do is remove the topographic face. Uh, which is one of the standard steps in the INSAR processing, including what we did in the demonstration here. The other necessary correction is to convert the interferogram phase that's measured in radians to displacement in meters. And we do that uh, using the radar wavelength, uh, which is you actually multiply by the wavelength divided by 4 pi. Uh, there are other corrections uh, that are um, more optional, uh, including uh, atmospheric corrections. Uh, that's kind of a, an advanced topic that we don't have uh, time to talk about here. Uh, what is the minimum area uh, region of interest to study a landslide with Sentinel-1 uh, with respect to the spatial resolution? Is it possible to use together with Sentinel-2? The minimum size that you, of a landslide that you can study will depend directly on what is the spatial resolution of the satellite or airborne radar that you use. Uh, in general, you need about uh, 20 by 20 pixels of the radar to uh, reliably measure the motion with INSAR. And since the Sentinel-1 satellite has a resolution of about 14 meters, the smallest landslide you can study is about 250 meters wide. Uh, you can probably detect smaller landslides, but it's going to be difficult to study them in, in detail. Uh, Sentinel-2 uh, is an optical satellite, and it can be used to uh, measure large motions using uh, pixel offsets um, similar to what we do with the uh, pixel offsets on the Sentinel-1, as I described earlier in this uh, webinar. Question number five. Is it possible to measure the depth of soil eroded with Sentinel-1 or the amount of soil eroded by volume? And the, que the answer is no. Uh, you, once there's significant erosion of the, at the surface, the INSAR phase will become incoherent and you can't measure the amount. You can detect where the erosion has occurred, where the erosion has occurred, by looking at the coherence map, but you can't determine the amount. Sentinel-1 satellite uh, acquires data on both ascending and descending uh, orbits. Which one do we use and why? Well, you should use the uh, look direction that best images the area that you want to study and this will depend on the local slope direction and the direction that the landslide is moving. Uh, if the landslide is moving uh, in a direction that's parallel to the radar track, then the line of sight it will not see any motion. Uh, but the best option is if you can get good interferograms from both directions, then you can use the combination of the ascending and descending data to separate vertical and horizontal motion. Oh. What are the requirements for interferometric analysis, such as image should be taken from similar orbit, from one identical satellite, or images from both satellites, uh, Sentinel-1A and 1B can be used and still have uh, interferometry? Well, in INSAR requires that the data be acquired on exactly the same orbital track. It can't just be similar. Uh, the Sentinel, because the uh, radar antenna has to be in exactly the same uh, location and looking in the same direction. 
the Sentinel 1A and, and 1B satellites are built with uh, identical radar systems and they share the same orbit so they can be combined and used interchangeably uh, for interferometry. Are there SAR images in the X-band for South America available in the NASA database? Are, and if the, are they free to use and download? The X-band satellite data from Terrasar X and uh, Cosmos SkyMed uh, satellite uh, systems are uh, only available from the German uh, DLR and Italian ASI space agencies. Uh, NASA does not have any permission to share that data. Uh, both uh, the DLR and uh, OSI uh, have some programs where researchers can apply to get data for no charge, but it's not a, available uh, for uh, download uh, in general. Do you have any suggestions for selecting the images based on the P baseline? That uh, I presumably means the perpendicular baseline. Uh, the perpendicular component of the baseline is the the key uh, factor for doing interferometry. And uh, the question is, what what is the most ideal baseline for Palsar, Sentinel-1, and Tandemax? I would like to do SBAS uh, SAR processing. Well, the, the best baseline for measuring ground deformation is always zero baseline. Um, the Sentinel-1 satellites are operated uh, in a way to keep the baselines short. Uh, so basically, the baselines are always short enough to do INSAR. You don't need to worry about which pairs you process. The JAXA ALO satellite, the, the first ALO satellite, uh, was allowed to drift during its uh, mission. And that means that the baselines vary a lot. Uh, up to uh, 5,000 meters. Uh, the usable baseline uh, will depend on the local slope, uh, but in general, the perpendicular baselines uh, of our, that are less than about four to 600 meters are usable for ALOS. Hi, I'm interested in seeing landslides around Brandon, Manitoba in Canada. Is it available? Yes, the Sentinel-1 data is available for uh, all places on the, on the Earth. Uh, some places have more data than others. Uh, I don't know the specifics about uh, Manitoba, but uh, I would guess that there's uh, data available at least every 12 or 24 days. Um, most of the eastern part of North America, the Sentinel-1 satellites acquire data only on the ascending tracks, not uh, on the descending tracks. So you may only have one look direction. Uh, my Sentinel-1 tool snap did not work. Uh, can you help me to find the issue and why it is not working? Uh, there is an excellent uh, forum uh, that ESA operates for the SNAP uh, software, and it's easy to get uh, help on uh, how to get it uh, to solve problems uh, through the uh, forum. What if the image uh, study area Study area is located in the uh, in subswath one IW one and subswath two IW two, but only in uh, uh, burst one and two. Uh, should we split the image and process the DNSR separately and then merge it after that? Um, it. Uh, Generally, uh, almost all SAR, INSAR systems, you have to actually process the, the uh, subswath separately to interferograms and then combine them. Uh, I don't remember the details of how SNAP works, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it works that way. 
Question 13. If I don't see any fringes in my interferogram and it, there's also less coherence in the, coher in the uh, coherence image, is there any chance I'll be getting a good DEM using INSAR with Sentinel-1? If you don't see any coherence and you don't see any fringes, then you're not going to be getting any useful DEM. Uh, What are the other possible applications for INSAR other than its usage in landslides and volcanology? Uh, well, uh, I use uh, INSAR very often to study earthquakes. Uh, that's uh, actually one of the first uh, applications of INSAR uh, was the Landers earthquake in 1992. And uh, all, the other uh, very early application of INSAR was to study motion of glaciers uh, in, uh, in Greenland. So those are uh, two um, big applications. Uh, another uh, use that's been very uh, often used in the last uh, years is uh, to measure ground motion due to uh, uh, withdrawal or injection of fluids in, into the earth, uh, such as groundwater or uh, oil extraction. That's a very popular uh, use. Uh, so question number 15, the geographic coordinates depends on the map projection. Uh, Yes, the map projection that you use will uh, determine what geographic coordinates you end up with for the geocoded interferogram. Is there any Python or R package to INSAR processing? Uh, the INSAR scientific computing environment uh, that I mentioned uh, in the presentation uh, ISCE uh, is uh, largely written in Python. It uh, it has some subroutines that are written in Fortran and uh, C, C++ uh, to uh, that are. But at the top level driving of the INSAR processing is all done in uh, Python. So that's an example. I don't know of any. Uh, R package to do INSAR processing. Can I subset it from the start in order to use less memory and be less time consuming? Uh, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, SNAP uh, allows you to select uh, uh, a limited subset of the bursts to do the processing uh, from the uh, uh, from the beginning, you can't do a subset uh, based on a latitude longitude area. Uh, you have to uh, do it based on the bursts. Uh, uh, the one thing is that you need to have at least two bursts uh, in order to uh, be able to do uh, uh, the uh, the processing in in, in uh, I think in in Snap and and certainly in in the ICE software. Can I use homemade DEMs for topographic phase removal, uh, such as uh, DEMs from uh, digitized paper topographic maps? Uh, yes, uh, I don't remember exactly what the procedure is for uh, SNAP, but uh, in general, you can use different TEMs, uh, including ones that uh, you get from uh, digitizing maps. Uh, you, you have to get it into the specific format that uh, your INSAR processing software requires. Which polarization is best for interferogram formation? Direct polarizations or cross polarizations? 
uh, for interferometry, we almost always use the uh, what we call the copole or direct uh, polarizations, VV or, or HH. Uh, because uh, the signal to noise or uh, level is better uh, in the uh, co uh, in in the co pole uh, polarization. What is the precision of the displacement? Uh, the precision of the displacements is. Uh, from measured with INSAR is uh, on the order of about one tenth to one twentieth uh, of the radar wavelength. So it will depend on the radar wavelength. Uh, the uh, Sentinel satellite has a radar wavelength of six centimeters. That means you can measure uh, with a precision of about uh, between three and, and six millimeters uh, in one interferogram. But that still depends on the, uh, the accuracy uh, depends on the uh, coherence. If you have very high coherence, then there's little noise and you can measure uh, an accuracy that's something uh, uh, relatively close to the precision. But if the coherence is low, then you uh, will have much higher, uh, much much worse accuracy. Uh, in addition, there's uh, the accuracy will be affected by uh, uh, effects on the radar propagation, such as uh, the uh, atmospheric water vapor uh, that can cause errors. Uh, uh, in, in the uh, radar interferograms. In general, uh, for landslides, because they're small, the topograph, the uh, atmospheric errors are uh, less of a problem. Is it possible to do, identify deformation in urban areas? Yes, in, uh, urban areas are actually one of the best places to do interferometry because uh, the coherence uh, of the radar uh, interferograms is very high in, in urban areas. There's lots of buildings to strongly reflect the radar and the buildings don't move very much. So uh, urban areas are actually uh, the best uh, places to measure uh, deformation. Uh, even in uh, tropical areas, uh, urban areas, uh, will be coherent in general, uh, even though uh, the, the less urbanized areas in, in tropical forests will be incoherent. How can we combine different source interferograms, i.e. UAV versus uh, satellite to try and complement and get a complete characterization of a landslide? Once you've converted your uh interferograms to line of sight displacements uh and you know what the line of sight vectors are uh for each pixel which are normal uh results uh in the insar processing then you can combine uh multiple uh interferometric measurements to determine uh the if you have enough uh, different uh, measurements, then you can get the full three-dimensional deformation, as we did for the uh, Mud Creek landslide uh, using uh, UAV SAR and uh, the Sentinel One uh, ascending and descending data. What is the minimum size of landslide for detection? Uh, as uh, we had a question earlier about the minimum landslide size for studying, uh, to study a landslide, I think you need at least 20 by 20 pixels. Uh, but to detect that a landslide is, um, is moving, you could probably 
uh, see uh, things as small as uh, about eight by eight pixels. So for Sentinel, eight pixels is a uh, hundred meters, roughly. So a hundred by hundred meters would be uh, the smallest you could see uh, with uh, Sentinel. If we have used a VV polarized image now, what difference can we expect in the infrared if we use HH or HV polarized image? In what applications are HH, HV, and VV used? Uh, in general, uh, I'd say 99% of all the uh, INSAR studies use only a single interferogram, uh, at least uh, to date. Uh, in some cases, you can get uh, look at the different polarizations uh, as maybe you've seen in some of the other seminars the uh, the part of the ground surface and vegetation that the radar is bouncing off of uh, will vary depending on the radar polarization and what you the interferogram measures will be the motion of whatever uh, the radar is bouncing off of. So uh, in some cases, it's, be it's possible to use the different polarizations to try to uh, detect uh, differences in what, what height the, 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 ground, the radar is bouncing off of, uh, such as uh, penetration into the soil or uh, snow. How are the displacements monitoring based on multiple pairs of SAR images? Uh, I mentioned briefly uh, one of the time series analysis methods, uh, the called small baseline interferometry. There's also a, a more sophisticated analysis that's called uh, persistent scatterer interf interferometry. Uh, these are two different types uh, of what we call time series analysis, uh, which is a way of taking multiple uh, SAR images and determining the time history of the ground deformation. How can we unwrap phase better? Uh, number twenty-six. Uh, well, this is a <laughs> this is a, a good, good good question, and it's a, a something that people have uh, been working on for for a very long time. Uh, in general, the the way to unwrap phase better is to get uh, better quality data. Uh, either uh, by using uh, uh, a, a radar wavelength that, uh, like L-band, that has uh, less uh, uh, fewer fringes, uh, so the, there's uh, less uncertainty in in the phase unwrapping, and it has higher coherence. So in general. Uh, the L-band data will be much easier to unwrap than C-band or X-band data. Will the phase unwrapping functionality not now available for a Mac OS eventually be ported to the Mac? Uh, the, the, the Snafu phase unwrapping uh, software is uh, ported to the Mac. It's written in very standard C that's easy to compile on the Mac. Uh, the SNAP, the ESA people that uh, developed the SNAP software uh, decided not to uh, provide a pre-compiled uh, uh, version of SNAFU for the Mac, uh, just because they have uh, fewer Mac users than, than Linux or Windows, but it works fine on the Mac. 
the ICE, the ISCE software that I use also works fine on the Mac, including, including Snafu. How about validating obtained measurements? What other methods are often usually used? Uh, for earthquakes and volcanoes, we uh, often have GPS uh, stations uh, in the area that we can use to validate the deformation that we measure with INSAR. Uh, in general, landslides are, are quite small and, and people don't go out and install GPS stations. So uh, it's more difficult to validate uh, deformation measurements for landslides. And you would probably have to use some uh, ground-based uh, measurements uh, uh, to, to, uh, to do validation. Can we get offset tracking results in SNAP? Question number 29. Yes, uh, there is a, a offset tracking uh, module in SNAP. It was uh, primarily designed to look at uh, ice sheets uh, because uh, the ice moves very quickly and a lot of times you can only measure it with uh, offset tracking pixel offsets um, i haven't attempted to use it for looking at landslides i've used the ice software to uh, measure uh, pixel offsets If looking at a large area, should the, mo the images uh, covering the whole area be mosaic before processing? Uh, no. Uh, if you're trying to, uh, you you have to process each track uh, of inter of interferometry separately, and then uh, combine the uh, the in process data after. Uh, and in, for the snap processing, you also have to do the, the uh, subswaths first and then uh, combine them. How do you select your master and slave data sets when you go for an interferogram? What natural conditions do you consider? Do you look at precipitation data using trim? Uh, I have not actually used uh, the trim uh, data set to uh, look at uh, uh, heavy precipitation, uh, but it uh, could be a useful technique to avoid scenes that are taken during uh, heavy rainstorms. Uh, in general, uh, I work in areas that don't have uh, that much rain, so I don't haven't been worrying about it. But that's certainly something you uh, you want to uh, avoid uh, images taken while it's raining very strongly. In the webinar yesterday, in properties of the VV band, it said uh, no valid data used. Um, I, I, I'm not sure about the, uh, that particular detail of SNAP. I don't remember. I'll, I'll have to check on that and answer. I'll answer later in the online question. Following que question six, how can the ascending and descending uh, images be used, combined? Um, answer. Uh, question number 33, uh, you can combine ascending and descending data. Um, the, the simplest uh, way to combine them is to, uh, to add, add the two uh, displacement maps together. And the sum of the two displacement maps uh, will give you something like the uh, vertical component. It won't be exactly the vertical component. It might uh, 
but it gives you a, a rough idea. And the difference between the ascending and descending uh, interferograms uh, will give you the roughly the east component of the ground motion. Because the ascending and descending satellite images are not sensitive to north component, you can't really measure the north component with, uh, with satellites. For active fault movement assessment, can we effectively use uh, for INSAR? If yes, can we process it with SNAP or other preferred software? Yes, we use uh, INSAR to measure uh, active fault movement all the time. It's a, a standard uh, use of uh, INSAR to measure fault. Uh, the motion of, earth, of faults between earthquakes called interseismic. Is there any information uh, regarding ALOS PALSAR 2 open data set? Uh, JAXA announced uh, last month that they were going to be opening up uh, the ALOS 2 PALSAR 2 uh, data, um, but they didn't give any details. So I, I, I don't have any more details at this time. I hope to hear soon. Would it be possible to monitor landslide using single pass interferometric uh, acquisitions? Uh, yes. Uh, so single pass interferometry, as I explained earlier, is uh, used to measure um, the topography. And if landslides uh, move uh, a large amount, then uh, the topography will change and you could do a, 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 a topographic map before and another topographic map after and do a difference and see uh, the motion. The accuracy will be on the order of uh, meters. That goes back to the uh, difference in topographic sensitivity versus uh, uh, differential phase sensitivity uh, for INSAR. Uh, the topographic sensitivity is on the order of uh, meters, multiple meters, uh, whereas uh, phase you can measure to uh, around a centimeter. Besides SNAP, what other free software is available to use for the activity uh, uh, processing INSAR? Uh, there's the uh, JPL ICE software, ISCE, uh, another uh, free software is uh, called GMTSAR, GMTSAR, and that's now uh, available as part of the uh, uh, GMT package. Is it possible to calculate landslides using Google Earth Engine? No, at, uh, at this time, the Google Earth Engine only has the radar amplitudes, it does not have any phase, so you can't do any type of INSAR. Uh, and as far as I know, it doesn't do uh, any pixel offset measurements. Is there any cloud platform to process INSAR? Yes, the uh, European Space Agency has uh, several uh, sponsors, uh, several cloud platforms to do INSAR processing. Uh, in their, uh, uh, it's called TEP, uh, Thematic uh, Exploitation Platform. NISAR is uh, going to, now that NISAR is going to work with a wavelength of 12 centimeters, what is it necessary for? Cover medium higher vegetation. Uh, yes, uh, the 12 centimeter wavelength uh, will give additional information about the uh, of vegetation, especially uh, uh, because you'll with two different radar wavelengths, you'll be sensitive to more uh, different uh, types of uh, 
vegetation. Uh, and the shorter wavelength will have uh, more sensitivity to smaller ground motions. The resolution of the uh, S band and L band uh, for NISAR, the spatial resolution will be the same. Uh, question number 41, is it possible to combine a DEM generated with surveying work with the INSAR process? Uh, uh, yes, it is. there are methods to combine uh, DEMs for, uh, from different uh, methods, uh, but that's uh, quite an advanced topic. There's another question about a uh, problem with SNAP, uh, which I answered earlier. You can get data uh, from the, uh, you can get in help from the uh, SNAP forum. Is it possible to subset an image based on a shapefile in SNAP? No. Why do we say that we have good correlation at L band in SAR? Because uh, L band has the long uh, 24 centimeter radar wavelength, then uh, the ground surface uh, changes. Uh, don't affect the the coherence and the more places stay coherent at L band than uh, at uh, C band. Question number forty five: What are the advantages of PS INSAR? That's uh, I think uh, the they mean that persistent scatterer INSAR. Uh, for landslide monitoring. Uh, persistent scatterer INSAR is an advanced processing technique uh, that uh, is uh, able to uh, extract uh, coherent pixels uh, from areas that are uh, may not be all coherent and so therefore you can get uh, measurements in areas where uh, some parts of the image are coherent and other parts are not uh, and also because of the way that the ps insar processing is done it can give uh, a higher uh, accuracy of the uh, measurements but it also uses a uh, uh, much more sophisticated uh, software that's generally uh, proprietary. Is the adaptive filter of 0 0.44 as applied in the demo uh, fixed or the best determined range for landslides? Or can one play around with the figure? You should definitely play around with the uh, the uh, filter parameter to see what works best for your site. Uh, pixel offset, uh, question number 47. For pixel offsets, do we need ground control points scattered in the image? If there's no ground control points, how can the offset be assessed between the two radar images? One of the big advantages of uh, SAR uh, imaging is that the image geometry is very stable. That means that uh, you can measure uh, dis displacements uh, with uh, only a single uh, ground control point within the scene. Uh, can we process optical images with SNAP? Yes. SNAP uh, also processes uh, Sentinel-2 optical images and uh, some other satellites. And I think we've reached the end of the questions and uh, I'm uh, happy to uh, answer some questions by email uh, later. And I thank you for listening to this webinar. Bye. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fielding, for the great webinar today, the great demo. Thank you for, to all the participants.
for hanging in there for all the questions. Remember, there's one more webinar in this series tomorrow. Nicolas Grunfeld from the Argentinian Space Agency will be talking about how to generate a digital elevation model. So tune in. Thank you and have a great day.